Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining me tonight on Monday, 8 o'clock UK time or just a little bit after. Blame Ian Munro for the few minutes after 8. I had to wait till he got home. Uh, but uh, again, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for all the comments and stuff that are coming in the chat room. It's really busy, which is great. And if you haven't had a chance to yet, just send a quick message out on your social media to let you know, to let everyone know that you're uh, you're joining me on this because they might want to do it as well. Uh, but I've got a few things I want to go through with you tonight. It is, uh, you know, you can see by the title there, it's called Practical Photoshop for Photographers. Um, so we're going to go through just a couple of things. They're not necessarily earth shattering, but I think because they are so simple, you might not think about them, or maybe that's just me, I don't know. But uh, there's a couple of things to do with selections, uh, colour, and then something for those of you who use actions, because I had a letter come through from somebody who explained that an action that I'd sent out, they couldn't get to work, and I kind of figured out why that was, so I'm going to share that with you as well. But no time like the present, might as well dive in straight away. Let's go to my desktop, and we'll kind of have a look at what it is that I want to go with you through first of all. So on the screen now, you can see this picture of a World War II veteran that I photographed recently. Super, super guy by the name of Ken Doxey, who lives in a place called Burton-on-Trent. Really, I mean, that's such a great time photographing this guy. Um, real cheeky smile. That smile that you can see there is definitely a cheeky smile. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, but when I was taking his pictures, um, one of the things, well, in fact, let me just show you. That's the, this is the finished picture here, the one that I've got printed out, and I'll show you that towards the end. Um, this is one that I'm actually giving to uh, to Ken, but this is the original shot here. So we can see the lighting pattern's all the same. Uh, I had to do something with his medals here because I couldn't move him, move him around too much. He, he wasn't that mobile, so I didn't want to, you know, push and pull him all over the place. Um, but this is the chair here that we needed to change colour. You can see here's the original one. It's blue. In the final picture, we've added like a little red tint to it. I, th I think the blue just didn't work well, especially when he's got this blue jacket on as well. So I want to show you how we can make the selection of that. Now, if you've followed anything that I do in the past, you'll know that I've got a bit of a fetish when it comes to uh, making selections. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in uh, the fact that photographers do need to understand how to do selections. And that's not necessarily because you're going to be doing things like compositing and cutting things out and putting things into a picture. It doesn't have to be for that. It could be just something that you need to isolate to change the colour of, as in the case with this particular picture here. So I want to show you how you can do that. And obviously Photoshop being Photoshop, there are limitless ways that we can do selection. So what I'm going to do is just show you how I would do it, all right? If you've got a different way, great. If it's better than this, best you get yourselves a YouTube channel and share it then. Uh, but let me just show you a couple of things here, first of all. In the most recent version of Photoshop, there have been some updates, Kind of a lot of them kind of you know, sneaking under the radar, that you kind of see at first and think, well, that's okay, I might never use it. But I want to just show you. Let's just say, for example, that I wanted to make a selection of this guy here, make a selection of Ken, because maybe I wanted to do some uh, clarity, add some clarity to him and his clothing, and I didn't want to have to spend time brushing it in afterwards. Maybe I want to make a selection of him so he's isolated from the background uh, and I can quickly apply that clarity to him. What I could do is I could go to the Select menu now, and at the top here we've got the Colour Range, we've got Focus Area, which I don't know about you, but I've kind of tried it. I really can't really give that much love because when you click on focus area, basically what Photoshop's going to try and do is make a selection of the areas that are in focus. And it is very much hit and miss. So kind of like once you've seen it, yeah, very nice. Thank you very much. Don't think I'll use that again. Uh, but if we go to the select menu, we've also got one here called select subject. All right. And this, this is just so clever because... I don't know if you've maybe heard of something called Adobe Sensei. That's kind of like Adobe's online brain, and it can kind of differentiate. It's getting better and better and better. I'll tell you, ju Judgment Day is definitely on the way. But select this subject command here. Bearing in mind what we've got on the screen, you can see the background, the chair, and Ken. If I click on subject, Photoshop will be able to kind of tell me what, that it knows what a person is. Watch this. If I click on subject, Give it a few seconds and bang. It's differentiated between the chair and Ken to make a selection of him. And I know, yeah, it's not perfect. Bear in mind, this is all, you know, this is all pretty much new technology that they're introducing to Photoshop. But I think you can be fair enough to say that that is a damn good job straight away. You know, that's a really, really good job. There are some areas that I would need to finesse. So maybe I could come in to the toolbar here, get something like the quick selection tool and just drag up onto his trousers just like so. And that's 
pretty much it. Yeah, I would come in and finesse the hair, so I'd kind of take away the selection off the hair, because I don't know if you've seen any of the videos that I normally do. Whenever we're selecting hair, get the marching ants within the hair so that you can't see bits going through it, if that makes sense. So you can see how that line of marching ants now isn't high up so that we can see the chair through the back of it. And then what we do, you come to select and mask and you go, you know, you can use your refined edge brush to pick up the hair and so on and so forth. So that's pretty quick. I think you've got to agree that is pretty damn quick at make a selection of Ken. But here's something else. That's that's the subject command in the select menu. Over in the toolbar, where you'd ordinarily find things like the uh, quick selection tool and the tragic wand tool just here, you've now got the object selection tool. And with this one, we can kind of define an area to tell Photoshop, right, within this kind of marquee that I'm now going to draw out, there's an object. So if I let, let's just say, if I just drag out now this selecting area, you can see like the marching ants, I'm going to put it all around Ken and the chair, like so. Now, I, this is called select object, so it shouldn't select Ken. It should know the difference between a person and the chair. Let's just see, if I let go, bang, look at that. It's now selected the chair and not Ken. And yes, there are bits that it needs to kind of be finessed, but it doesn't take long to sort those out because now that I'm actually using this object selection tool, I can add to the selection the bits that it's missed, like on the chair down by the side of Ken's leg. So if I hold down the shift key, just like with any other selection tool, holding down the shift key will add to the selection. So we'll add to it, click, drag, let go, and it will then select the rest of the chair. This bit in between his legs here, hold down the shift key, click, drag, it'll then know the difference between his trousers and the chair, which I think is pretty damn impressive. Hold down the shift key, let's try and get this little bit in here, and let's have a look where else we go. It's done a good job going around the outside there. Now, bear in mind, I'll do another one of these little uh, disclaimers just to say that I wouldn't ordinarily work this quick. This is just to show you. But if we go around Ken here, you can see, look look at the how close the colours are and the contrast between the chair and Ken's jacket. Let's just see if we can get it to kind of come off that area there. Now, we don't want it to include the jacket, so this time, rather than holding down the Shift key, I'm going to hold down the Alt key or the Option key, depending on whether you're on Mac or... Uh, or PC, and I'll click and drag to say don't include that. All right, so it's kind of it takes a little bit of finessing sometimes, but we can see it does seem to learn as we go around now, saying right, get into that nice tight area there, don't include that bit there. We've also got the other selection tools we can use to come in and finesse it as well. But I'm going to really zoom around this quite quickly just to see how it goes. See how it picked up the side of that chair just there? Come in here. Well, not so good on that one there, but we could use another tool just there got the jacket we don't want to include the jacket so again I'm going to hold down the alt key or the option key click and drag to say don't include the jacket and look at that how good is that when you consider how close in contrast and color those bits are I think that is pretty damn amazing and I think we've got Lee there in the old uh, chat room saying you could you go into quick mask to touch it up absolutely Lee. there's no reason why you couldn't now turn to the other tools to kind of come in here and you know, kind of uh, finesse the, the actual selection as well. You could use any selection tool you ever want here now to kind of come in and finesse it. Uh, we don't want, we want it to kind of, let's have a look here. Let's just get it off the hair. So let's just Alt key, click, drag, get it off the hair just there. And we'll include that little bit just there. Job done. But that's pretty damn good, isn't it? That is really, I mean, that's that's pretty quick, all right? But, oh, for just one little bit down here. Look how close that is. Let's see if we can do something with this. This is a bit of the chair we want to include. So, again, hold down the Shift key to add to the selection. We'll click and drag out. Let's just see what it does, because that is a really difficult area. Not bad, not bad. Let's just include that there. Make it learn, learn a bit more. Now, this area here, whoops, don't want to press that. Right, this area here, I could just maybe turn to the lasso tool. Hold down the shift key, and I'll just draw that out to include that. Whoops, no, we don't want to do that, actually, do we? We want to hold the alt key, and we'll come and take that off just there, and we'll add that bit in just there. And like I said, disclaimer, I am going quick, but that's a pretty quick way of making the selection of uh, the chair as opposed to Ken. Now, when it came to changing the colour, once I'd done this, took my time to make sure that everywhere was nicely selected. That's driving me mad down the bottom here. 
let's just quickly add that into the selection there lasso tool plus key or shift key right there you go job done all right so how did i change the color of it really in fact no let's first of all go to the select and mask at the top of the screen you can see now if we increase the transparency there you can see that it's picking up the chair we don't want to include the hair just here so we're going to go and get the refine edge tool and let's just paint over the hair look how it's picking up all those really small hairs there to make sure that they're not included that has definitely got better the refine edge tool has definitely got better since they introduced that into photoshop as well so it's you know pretty damn impressive stuff and we'll just increase the transparency like so and obviously just like normal you've got all the controls over on the right hand side here like using the smart radius which sometimes isn't smart but you know in this case it's not too bad at all we can increase the radius we've got the smoothness also you maybe want to feather the edge just a touch so it's not perfectly sharp outline because then it would look really obvious what you've done uh, and just sort of tinker around with those there but when it comes to um the output here at the bottom we've got a choice of outputs that we can have and i tend to leave mine a lot to selection so i'll leave it a selection we'll click ok that'll send me back into photoshop now and it'll leave me with that now best practice certainly what i do anyway i'm not saying that what i do is the best practice but what i've learned to do to save myself uh, any heartache in the future even though that didn't take that long to do one thing i would always do is go to the select menu save selection and I would call that something like chair and then click OK so no matter what happens now that selection is always saved you'll find it in the in the uh, channels just here where it says chair and you can always load it in later on if you went to uh, in, uh, layer you could go to load the cha uh, load that particular channel in or that selection there so just in case you inadvertently not the computer and you lose it and whatever it's like a fail safe method but now that we've got that let's have a quick look here i'm going to change the color this is exactly how i did it when it came to the actual retouch something as basic as hue and saturation we click on colorize and yeah you're going to see little bits that maybe i've missed but you know disclaimer you know in fact let's just go for that again disclaimer all right you know i'm just working quick but once we click colorize we can then just use the hue slider to change it to whatever color we want and i kind of went for this kind of red here we can reduce the saturation we can make it a little bit darker and so on and so forth so i think that's you know pretty quick way of making a selection this adobe sensei how it can identify what is a subject and what is an object is quite phenomenal and that's only going to be getting better as time goes on and no this is not an adobe advert all right it's, i just think it's incredible i think really we all sometimes wonder why do i need to upgrade when little things like this come in that can really help you with your workflow and kind of speed things up then it's great but if you're not somebody who needs to do something quickly then you know hey ho but i just think it's a really really good bit of kit right let's take a quick break we'll then uh, i'll show a quick advert and then we're going to come back with the actions <music> Blimey, that video finishes quicker than I remember. Uh, <laughs> right then, I didn't even load the next picture in. All right, so what we're going to do now, I'm going to multitask now. Let me just get rid of this while that's on there and you can't see what I'm doing. But basically what we're going to do now is something to do with actions. All right, so uh, let me just show you this letter here. You know, sometimes when people say, I get loads of letters coming through and they don't. They really don't. I actually did get a letter. So this is proof in the pudding here. I did actually get a letter come through and this is the letter here. And it's from a guy called Alec Himwich. Uh, and basically, I, I mean, I, I want him to be my best friend because I love that opening sentence. If you write this letter to me with that opening sentence, you're definitely going to be my best friend. Uh, but within there, he's put basically, uh, basically explained that I sent out, I made available on my newsletter, my email group, a frequency separation action. All right. Uh, and he's kind of explaining there that it's, he's having a problem using it. He likes it, but he can only seem to use it at the very start of his retouching when he has a locked background layer. All right. So, whoops, there we go. So, to there. so for those of you who don't know, okay, those of you who do know this, bear with me. But an action in Photoshop is a way that you can get Photoshop to do 
to perform certain tasks that you do on a regular basis. So it can be all manner of different things. It could be uh, giving color adjustments, it could be saving, it could be cropping, it can be all kinds of things. Things that you do on a regular basis, rather than you going click, 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 every single time you can record those steps, press play and Photoshop will automatically do it for you. The only problem, and I'm going to bring up a little diagram here, the only problem when we use actions is if they are recorded uh, in such a way that when you record the action uh, by doing something on your own pictures, it actually doesn't just record the steps, it records the names of the layers that you're doing it on. And if you then go and use that action on a different picture and it hasn't got layers called that, it's going to cause it a problem. And that's exactly what's happening with this frequency separation um, uh, action that I've kind of sent out. So let me just dive over to my desktop and I'm going to load in this picture here to show you an example of what I mean. So let me just go to my desktop. We'll go to YouTube Live and I'll load in this one here. So this is a uh, picture of a friend of mine called Barry, Barry King, who was uh, photographed him yesterday, helped me out with doing a little bit of uh, filming for the new tutorial that's coming out. It's a large file, very large file, as you can see why it's taking so long to come in. But that's basically what we've got there. So now the actions panel, again, over on the right hand side, I've got it just up here. Now, I appreciate this is quite small, even though I've got the resolution, resolution set up really well. Um, it's still going to be very small for you, so just bear with me, all right, bear with me. Now, what you'll see I've got here, ignore these two at the top. I've got ones here called Action Fixer, which is what I'm going to explain to you about, and one called Magic Merge. But this one underneath here called Frequency Separation. This is the one that I've sent out to people, and Alex said that he just can't seem to get to work unless he uses it at the very start of his retouching and he's getting an error. I'm gonna show you what that error is now, because look, if you look in the layers panel, I've got all these things that I've done, and ordinarily I would be doing it right at the start. But let's just say now that I now have done all this stuff, and now at this point in my retouching, I want to do my frequency separation. So let's just click on the action just up here. We're highlighting it at the bottom. Now we've got the play button, and I'll click play. Oh, and it worked. Now, right, it worked. It worked. Right, let's just rewind because that shouldn't have done that. I've actually got this recorded to do well. Now, close your eyes for a second because I'm going to delete something I put in there, which is a really cool bit of stuff. Right, okay, so now let's just say that I want to do the frequency separation. I'll click on play, and then this is the, uh, the uh, error that you get. It says the command select is not currently available. And if I open up the frequency separation, let's just stop that. If I open up the frequency separation, you probably just see there it's looking for layers called layer one copy, and that's not what it's got within the layer stack here. So I wanna show you a fix, because you may have so many actions that you keep getting this problem with, I think this is gonna be a real down and dirty kind of fix for you, all right? So let me just show you. Right, so let's just say then I want to do this at the very uh, this point in my retouching. I've created a little action at the top here called Action Fixer. And I'm just going to click on that by press, and then press play. And I'm going to show you what it's done. So it doesn't look like much has happened, but if we look in the tabs over here, here's the picture that we we're originally looking at with all the layer stack. Now what Photoshop has done is it has created a duplicate of that, flattened it all down, and made it into one single layer called background. Now that I've got that, I can click on the frequency separation, click play, so now I've got all the little bits in here that I need for my frequency separation. And then I've got this thing here called Magic Merge. If I click on that and press play, I go back to my original document. All the layers that I need for doing frequency separation are included and it's closed that other document. Does that make sense? So now I can start to do my frequency separation in the original document. Now this could be any action that you're having problems with. This will enable you to, to work on it. It just so happens that the frequency separation one does have merged layers within it. So obviously, you know, you're gonna have to kind of delete stuff if you wanted to go all the way down to make changes further down the layer stack. But this is purely to illustrate how we can get an action that doesn't work 
to work, all right? So now that we've done that, I wanna show you how we can record those actions and what you need to do. So I'm actually going to delete the ones we've got. So I'll click on Action Fixer, click on the trash can, and click OK. Click on Magic Merge, click on the trash can, and click OK. All right, so what is the first thing we're going to do? I've got a folder here called My Actions. You can create whatever one you want to call it. And I'm going to click on the little plus icon, and I'll name this one Action Fixer. All right, and we'll click Record. Now, I apologize if you already know this kind of stuff, but maybe you don't. You know, I want to show you these kind of few steps that I've used as my down and dirty way of fixing this particular problem. You can see now the little red record button is going. That's only going to record the steps that you do. It's not kind of recording the time it's taking you to do them. So don't worry about pausing and all that kind of stuff. So the first thing we're going to do is go to Image, Duplicate. It brings up the duplicate image dialog here where we can give it a different name. We don't need to worry about that. We'll click OK. Now we've got two versions of that same image. Then what I'm going to do is going to uh, uh, image, no, you go to uh, edit, <laughs> layer, flatten image. And this is important, layer, flatten image. Because then that will compress all those layers down and it will create a background layer, which is what we need. Once you've done that, you can then uh, click on stop. So that's now done, all right? That's that one done. Then you could go and do whatever, you know, sort of uh, thing that you wanted to do, like your frequency separation action. It'll now work if I just click play. See how it works? Absolutely fine. But now we need to create an action that's gonna put all this stuff back into our original picture so that we can just carry on, all right? So we're gonna call this one Magic Merge. So we'll click on the little plus icon at the bottom here to create a new action. So we'll click on that. In the name, they will call it Magic Merge and press record. Now, we've got the uh, layers here in this frequency separation folder. Again, this could be any layers here, but whilst the very, very top one is selected, Hold down your shift key and click on the very bottom one. And we can see in the actions here, it's already recorded what we've just done. Then we'll go to edit and copy. Then we'll go file and close because we no longer need this duplicate open. So we'll click no to don't bother saving it. Then we'll go to edit and paste. So now we can see in our original document with all those layers, we now have our frequency separation layers that we can then carry on working all within the same document. If you wanted to, you could actually delete the one there called background, you don't need it, but then you can just carry on doing that kind of stuff just there, all right? So hopefully that's gonna help you if you've got my frequency separation action and you just can't seem to get it to work. Let's just click on close on that one there. Did I actually record any of the layers there? Let's just, uh, I don't need to include that. And we don't need to include that one. Okay, all right. So now that we've done that, I wanna show, I'm gonna have a quick break and there's a couple of extra little bonus things I wanna show you that you might not know about.
Right, so just looking in the uh, the chat room there, I noticed uh, a guy called Brian Dunkel. He's quite rightly said, I thought there was a way that you could go into the action, all the steps that you've got there, and make changes to it, sort of select layer and what have you. So you can actually tweak all the bits in there. You definitely can do that, Brian, but the problem is if you've got an action that's got lots of steps into it, that's a lot of changes you've got to make on just one action. And if you're like some people I know have got loads of actions, that's a lot of work to do. And I just kind of saw this as being a quick fix that you could use on pretty much any action that you have this particular problem with. But uh, Brian, you're quite right. There is definitely a way of doing it. It's just a long way to do it. And I haven't got the time or the hair to pull out doing it. <laughs> All right. So uh, moving on from that, then just a couple of extra little bonus things I want to show you here, which are really, really useful. Um, now, obviously, you might have a load of different actions available to you here. All right. What you don't want to do is have to keep individually clicking on action fixture, then the actual action, then magic merge and all that kind of stuff. It might be nice if Photoshop could kind of tell you that, you know, it kind of knows what it needs to do. All right. And there's a little there's a little thing you can do here. So what I'm going to do, I am going to go to the frequency separation action here. And I'm going to click on this little arrow to the side of the name to open up all the little steps that we've got within it, all right? So all this kind of stuff here. This is what's great about actions. Look at all these steps here that I no longer have to do. I don't have to do them manually. I can just click on play and Photoshop does it for me. But rather than me having to make the decision about whether or not something's got a background layer or it hasn't, I can actually, rather than changing lots of things within all these steps, I can just add one thing to make Photoshop really help me out. Now, if you've got the actions panel open, in the top right hand corner here, you've got like three lines, three horizontal lines above each other. When I click on that, we get a little menu come up. And one of them down here says insert conditional. And I'm going to open that up there. Now, insert conditional, what is that? Now, if you're old enough to remember, and I'm guessing some of you are, there used to be these books years ago. They might still do them now, actually. Something like Dungeons and Dragons, that kind of thing, where it would say, You've now reached the end of the hallway. There are two doors, a blue door and a red door. If you want to go through the blue door, turn to page 51. If you want to go through the red door, go to page 60. So you've got options, you know what I mean? And that's the same thing with these conditions here in Photoshop. You can notice in this little uh, properties thing here, it says, if this, then that, otherwise do this. All right, so for example, with our particular one here, if I go to the if current menu, the very, very top one, and scroll down, there's lots of different variables we can use. But I can say, right, if this layer is a background, which is ideally what we want this to be, then don't do anything. All right, so just carry on and do all those steps within that particular action itself, the frequent separation or whatever. If it's a background, just carry on as you were. Otherwise, play this action to fix it. All right, so if this, then that. Otherwise, do this. And let's just click OK. Now that's gonna put this little action here, this little step called if. Now what I can do is click on that, and I'm gonna drag this all the way up to the very, very top of these particular steps. So it's the very first thing that Photoshop does. It has to make a decision. Is this person trying to use this action on a background layer? If they are, carry on as normal. If they're not, open up the other action fixer. All right, so let's just give it a go, shall we? I'm now not on the background layer. Let's just see if this works. I'm gonna click, I hope it does now, I've done this. Let's cl click on play. No warning dialogue. No, there you go, you see, see what's happened? What Photoshop has done is it played the action fixer so it created a duplicate document, it flattened it, and it then ran the rest of the steps of the frequency separation. How good is that? And then the last thing you need to do is go to Magic Merge, click on Play, that <laughs> and I've got an error, but it brings it over into the original document here so we can now do our frequency separation and just carry on as normal. So just by using that if prompt, that little condition, you can help get Photoshop to really, really help you out. So that's that one there. Now, one other little bonus thing that I wanna show you that is, again, is a real big help, especially if you're somebody who does record quite a lot of actions. Let me just create a duplicate document with uh, the background on it just here. So we've got that background layer there. Now, 
In my frequency separation, I'm going to make another little tweak to it down here. All these different steps, at some point what I do is this one here. I add some Gaussian blur to the image. That is part of the process of setting up this frequency separation. And when I originally recorded the action, I told Photoshop to blur it at a radius of five pixels. But that might be different for other images, not just the one that I recorded it on. So it would be nice rather than Photoshop kind of applying the same amount of blur to every single image I use it on, it would be nice if it would stop and say, Glyn, how much do you want to blur this by? And this is what we can do to help uh, to get Photoshop to do this. Where we have the name of that particular step, where we've got like a filter that's being used, to the left-hand side of it, we've got an empty square box, a little checkbox. If I now little tap in there, you see this little icon that appears. I don't know what you call that really, but it's an icon that appears, all right? So now look what's happened. Now that I've done that, let's see what happens. We'll go to the top of the start of the actual uh, steps. We'll click on play. And now, rather than just going all the way through, it brings up the Gaussian blur, uh, blur dialog box and allows me to manually dial in the amount that I might want to do for that particular image, which gives you so much more control rather than just letting actions do the same old thing to every single image. Because every image is different and every image will need slightly different settings. So I kind of I hope that is useful. Um, we'll click cancel on that one just there. Let's close that down just there. Now I'm going to give. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat room just for a few minutes. I'm going to play you another little video now. This is another segment from the upcoming tutorial, classic portraits with one flash, and this is actually one I thought I'd just kind of show you now, actually, because I get asked a lot about camera settings when I'm taking the kind of portraits like they want to see of Barry and Ken and all these other people. Um, I want to show you a little video that explains about my camera settings because. How I use that now has definitely changed. I'm now tending to use the ISO more than I ever used to. So let me just play that for you now, and I'll be back afterwards. All right, so now that we're actually in the position where we're taking the photos, I think this will probably be the best time to talk about camera settings, maybe lens choice, and also the flash settings, because these have changed considerably for me over the last six months to a year, something like that. Uh, just to quickly mention the lens then, what am I using? For these ones here, these ones where we're getting either the full length shot, three quarter, or the seated shots, uh, I'm using a prime lens. Now that's not to say that prime lenses are better than zoom lenses or anything like that, it's purely a personal choice. What I found when I was using a zoom lens was I became quite lazy. So when I was trying to get different shots, I would literally just sit in the same position and just zoom in and zoom out. What I find with the prime lens is it makes me get up and move around a bit more so I can try different angles. So it kind of gives me a bit more creative kind of freedom, I guess you could say. But absolutely nothing wrong with using a zoom lens. But for focal length, I'm using 35mm, all right? But when it comes to camera settings, now the camera I use is a Sony. Uh, and I've got this one set into manual, all right? So the camera for me is always going to be in manual. And my starting point settings is roughly F8 or F11. The reason for that is it means that the eye of the camera is almost kind of squinting down a little bit. So when I'm photographing Anthony, all of him is gonna be in focus, all right? So it's not gonna be kind of, I'm not look, looking at his face and going straight down. He's actually got the knees which are coming forward of the body. So I need from the tip of his knee, if you like, and beyond his ear to be nice and sharp in focus. That's just my own personal taste. And I find F8, F11 works for that. Uh, my ISO, I'll start off with 100, because it's a nice, you know, nice clean file there, low noise. And what else we're gonna go for shutter speed, 125th of a second. All right, so 100 ISO, 125th of a second, F8, F11. Now at the moment, I'm gonna keep my flash off. Now, because when I use my particular camera here, if I turn my trigger on, it gives me almost like a live view so I can see everything. I don't really want that. Now, the reason I don't have the flash on at the moment is this. I want to kind of find out what is the ambient light going to be in the picture. Now, there are going to be parts of the picture, certainly the way that Anthony is positioned at the minute. When that flash goes off, that light hits him, there are certain parts, certainly in the bottom left-hand corner of the frame there, that aren't going to get any light. And if I don't kind of control how much ambient light is in there, it's gonna be very, very dark, okay? And yeah, I know we can go into things like Lightroom or Capture One and use the shadow slider to bring in that detail, 
but why would I want to do that in the computer when I just have to make a few settings in the camera? That's, that's all it needs to be. And also, if I start to do too much of that in the, in the computer, we can start to see images break down. Not necessarily with every file from every camera, but some camera brands, you might find that you start to get a bit of breakdown there. So what I'll do is I'll have the flash off. I've got my settings in the camera here, 125 uh, shutter speed, f8 on this one here. And all I will then do, I'm gonna use the ISO, the sensitivity of that sensor there, to bring in how much ambient light I want. I don't want to change the depth of field, the aperture. That needs to stay as it is. And ideally, I want to stay at 125th of a second because it's going to be razor sharp. I could go maybe down to a 60th because we're using flash. And we know that flash freezes any kind of movement. But a happy place for me is 125th of a second. So then all I will do is I'll come into my settings here and I'll just go on to the ISO and I'll just alter the ISO until I can see enough ambient detail within the frame that I want to have. So for this one here, if we just kind of back off just a little bit, let's just reframe that. I can just bring that down to see the shadow. I can see now in the bottom left-hand corner there, I'm getting detail. So I know no matter what, we're gonna have detail there. When I've done that, that's when I turn the flash on. So let's just recompose this just for a second. And we'll turn the trigger on so that the flash is now ready to go. All right, so I hope that was helpful. Um, using the ISO now is something that I do tend to do. Although I'm shooting on a, on a tripod, I don't want to bring the uh, shutter speed down. So I like to keep it in the happy place, like I said in the video, of around about 125th of a second. And now using the ISO, because let's face it, cameras nowadays, the technology is just outstanding. So we can bring them up. If you've been following the kind of stuff that I've been doing lately, certainly with the veterans, with the pe uh, pictures of uh, Peter Morgan. I did a portrait of Peter Morgan, uh, Barry yesterday, my friend Stuart, um, all of those there, really, the ISO is going to be around about a thousand ISO. Would you know that? Not at all. But it's allowing me to make sure that there is detail every single place within that picture. Even the dark areas, I do not want to go completely black and featureless. There has to be something in there. So I hope that's kind of useful. Um, I am working on loads more stuff with that one. Uh, not long until we're kind of finished and get that ready. I'm just waiting for the new website to go live now anyway. Uh, right, before we finish, a couple of things I want to let you know about. First one, if you haven't watched it already, there's a new episode of our He Shoots, He Draws podcast on available today. Uh, that was a, It's a corker. It is a proper corker. For those, it's mainly uh, relevant for those of you in the uh, in the UK, but there's a guy, there was a guy called Jerry Anderson years ago who was responsible for being the creator of programs like Thunderbirds, Joe 90, Captain Scarlet, Space 1999. Well, Dave has interviewed his son, Jamie Anderson, and it is an absolute blinder. So if you want to kind of trip down memory lane, I highly recommend uh, that you uh, have a tune into that, that. You'll find it on Apple iTunes and all the other kind of different places where you can get podcasts, also on the main website. Also, um, you might have known that I'm going to be doing this fundraising for the veterans, for the veterans charity and the taxi charity. I've just made available the very first volume of the Veterans Portraits book. Uh, there's going to be other volumes, but this one here, this will give you an example of some of the portraits that are in it. It's been put together by uh, Blurb, who were produced. I mean, the, the quality is, I mean, I'm really, really happy with it. I did have a version to show at the, at the exhibition for those of you who, uh, who kind of were, were there. Um, and what I've done with this is I've set it up so that you can buy it direct from Blurb. I don't make any money on it, uh, but the tiny amount of profit which there is, is a tenner, goes towards the fundraising towards the £50,000 I want to raise to share between those two charities. Uh, but there will be another another one coming out as well. Also, you've got Dave's book. Don't forget that now is currently available and we're starting to see all these different pictures that he's sharing of friends all around the world who are posting themselves, posting pictures themselves with it. It is a fantastic book. I ain't just saying that because he's my best mate, but he has totally nailed it. And even I now am starting to get to grips with InDesign, which has taken some doing. But uh, folks, whoops, let's go back to me. Whoop, you must see my desktop. That's me now. We're back on. Um, that's it. That's all I'm going to uh, do for you tonight. Next week, uh, I'm going to attempt to do uh, a live print. So I want to take people through the printing process. In fact, I've got a couple of examples just here. 
Let me show these ones here, which I'm going to, I've got the mounting to be done. And uh, I want to take you through the process because, you know, I love the photography. I love the retouching. I really love the printing. There is nothing better than having a physical print in your hand. And the satisfaction of doing a print yourselves, you can't beat it. So I want to kind of take you through the steps that I do to get me to, uh, to get the best prints I can. It's a, you know, it's, it's an absolute minefield. The amount of stuff in color calibration and, and color management, it's a nightmare. And I'm sure there'll be some people there who'll pick holes in it. But you know what? I don't care. When I do a print, what I see on screen and what I get in that paper match. That's all that matters to me. And I want to show you how I do that. Uh, so make sure I'll put the details of that very soon. It'll probably be a week today. Um, but that's it. I am now going to go and watch the recording, because I didn't see it last night, of SAS Who Dares Wins with a glass of wine and some homemade chips with Mrs. D. So uh, I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, friends out there, we've got Stuart, we've got Brian, we've got Anthony. They're the moderators. They're the management in the chat room. Uh, thanks for helping out. Anthony, again, before we started, uh, making sure that it all ran well. Uh, and that's it, folks. Thank you so much. I will catch you next time. Hi, I'm Glyn Dewis, and I want to let you know about my brand new book, The Photoshop Toolbox. Now, Photoshop is a huge piece of software that is constantly being updated, giving the user seemingly endless creative possibilities. But being such an incredible piece of software can also make it seem confusing and difficult to master. Now the book is made up of six chapters where we start off going through the basics to fully understand layers and then we move on to layer masks, brushes, blend modes, there's some bonus content and then a full tutorial bringing everything together in a complete retouch of an image from start to finish. You see I believe that no matter how much bigger Photoshop becomes, at the heart of Photoshop are three things, layer masks, brushes and blend modes. If we can learn to understand these three areas of Photoshop, the sky really is the limit. So that's the Photoshop Toolbox, available now.